The following sermon is presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado. We hope you'll be strengthened and encouraged by God's Word today as you listen. So this morning we're continuing in 1 John as some of the elders and, and Nick have gone through the last couple of weeks. We've looked at 1 John. Now uh, open up to 1 John, go to chapter 3. And I'll tell you up front, I'm terrible with outlines, okay? I just don't do outlines very well. But I came up with one for this morning, okay? So here it is. So turn to 1 John 3. So your first point is, you can write A or whatever you want to do there. 1 John 3, 4 through 17. And that's it. <laughs> so there you go. So nobody can accuse me of never doing an outline again. I want to read the uh, text for us this morning since we haven't read it publicly yet, and then we'll go on. So 1 John 3, starting in verse 4. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death unto life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? That's our text this morning. So last week, our uh, brother Nick finished off near the end of a sermon about having a confidence and not shrinking back from Jesus and shame at his second coming. And so it's the evidence or the lack thereof for that confidence in some cases we're going to be talking about this morning. He also remarked last week that you should or that you would find seat belts attached to your seats. But I want to tell you this morning that there are no seat belts. There are no flotation devices. There is only Christ. And we're going to need him this morning, trust me. So let's open up in a word of prayer. Father, I thank you for your word, and especially in 1 John, as we go through this morning, it would be my prayer that as we listen to what you have told us in your word, that we would have our hearts opened and that those who do not know you would be drawn to you and those who do know you would have a stronger confidence in you this morning. Be with us as we Go through your word, and I pray these things in the name of your Son, our faithful Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. In his novel, I'm a big reader, and I like to uh, read historical novels especially, and in his novel, A Tale of Two Cities, if you've ever read that, Dickens begins this way. This is how he opens it up. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom. It was the age of foolishness. It was the epic of belief. It was the epic of incredulity. It was the season of light, it was the season of darkness, it was the spring of hope, it was the winter of despair. We had everything before us, we had nothing before us. We were all going direct to heaven, we were all going direct the other way. That's a great opening to a book, isn't it? I've always liked that. Showing the contrast between two different concepts. But long before Dickens wrote that novel, God wrote his Long before there was a tale of two cities, God, through the Apostle John, wrote to us about a tale of two children. And we'll look at them today. 
So back in 1 John 2.29, he wrote this, You may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. Now in contrast, this morning he's going to turn his attention to those who do not practice righteousness or those who continue in sin. But before we dive into this, I want to make one thing clear. This letter is not about a carnal Christian versus a faithful one or a shallow faith versus a deeper faith, but rather whether you have faith, period. That's what he's getting at. It's not about how good of a Christian you are. It's about whether you're a Christian at all. Now, this ought to be a sobering text when you think about it that way, shouldn't it? And many don't like it because of the harshness of the reality that he writes about. But when it comes down to it, We don't have the right to tone it down, do we? This is what God wrote, so we preach that. We're dealing with the souls of people, precious, eternal souls. So we don't have the luxury of being able to ignore the things that we don't like. So John writes this letter so that those who believe in the name of the Son of God may know that they have eternal life. It's a worthy ambition, right? And so no one in this room ought to take that for granted this morning. So start in verse 4 this morning. He says, Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. Now, contrary to what we might think, this verse is not simply talking about breaking God's law. That's certainly implied, isn't it? Sin is lawlessness. But it's something more. How do we know this? Well, first, it would seem redundant. Wouldn't it? For John to say, if you practice sin, you also practice lawlessness. We know that. It's not a case of here's a law and you broke it, and there's a law and you broke it, and over there's a law and you broke it. Rather, the lawlessness here spoken of is not defined as multiple violations of the law, like you can count them up on your hands. That would be the sin, but rather a condition of the heart, the normal pattern of behavior for a person. That's what he's talking about. Those who practice Sin or lawlessness is a pattern of life for some people, and that's what he's addressing. So I want you to remember, though, the first context, or the context of 1 John. He's writing a letter to his flock, his little children, about false teachers, a counter against an early form of Gnosticism. You've heard that word last couple of weeks. He's writing to Christians who, who saw the numbers in their church leave, decrease, following after these false teachers because of what they were saying. And Gnosticism, as you hopefully know by now, and if you don't, was this idea that knowledge was important, the spirit was important, but the body was not. Matter was not. Matter was evil, so let's do away with the, the evil. And spirit is good, so let's keep the good or the knowledge. Thus, the result of that, obviously, is that conduct doesn't matter. If matter is evil and your body is matter, then the conclusion is it doesn't matter what you do. It just matters what you know. But John's going to make a point here that conduct does in fact matter. It defines a person. And the Greek word for practices is poeo. It's an imperfect tense. Greg's not here this morning. He'd be so proud of me if I knew this word right now. (laughs) Basically meaning that it is a state of existence. It's not just a one time here and there. It is what defines you as a person. How you are all the time. In other words, the state of people that John is talking about is one of continual, ongoing sin. He's not talking about someone who commits a sin, but rather someone who practices sin. We're not talking about one who falls into sin, but one who swims in it. There's a difference. Now, having that in mind, go to verse 5. You know that he appeared to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. He, being Jesus, of course, and he appeared to do what? to take away this sin. Not only in the sense of the atonement, which he did, so that forgiveness could be obtained, and not just in a legal satisfaction sense, which we call justification, but in a moral, life-giving, sanctified sense as well. Not just to justify you, but to set you apart as what? Holy. In order that, as one commentary put it, that sin might cease to exercise its tyrannical bondage. So he came to set you free, not just from the penalty, but the power. 
Now, something is missing in most English translations, and that's the fact that there's a little word there that doesn't get translated, and it's the word kai, which is either and or but. So verses 4 and 5 should be read continually like this. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness, and or but you know that he appeared to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. So John is reminding his readers, his flock, that they, those who practice this do so continually, but you know that Christ came to take that away. So John is setting up a contrast of righteousness and lawlessness. This is his theme this morning. The one in whom there is no sin and the one who practices sin. And he's going to start demonstrating the incompatibility between the two of them about being born of God and or abiding in Him and then living a life practicing sin. So Jesus Christ was manifest to take away sin, to deal with human sin, to deal with what we are by nature since the fall, and to also remove its pollution. He quite literally took them away, or, or as it says, he, he lifted and bore them on his own body. And that was always what he came to do. So perhaps John is harking back to his gospel. If you read the gospel of John and you read the letters of John, a lot of the places are remarkably similar. And you think about the testimony of John the Baptist that he records there, and he said, The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And he repeats it here. Again, remember context here. The false teachers John is combating denied that uh, Christ really had a body. They denied his true identity, that he was really God of God and man of man. The very Antichrist that Nick talked about last week, if they did not believe who Christ was, then he called them an Antichrist. Those who would rob Christ of the human nature that he took on. And of course, if they were right, then there's no reason and no way that Jesus appeared to take away sin. Because remember, to them, the body is evil, thus making sin really inconsequential. But praise be to God that he did appear born of a woman that he did take away sin, and so that those who live in it might be free from it, from its punishment, its power, and one day finally, its presence. But John doesn't stop. He doesn't just say he appeared to take away sin, but also, and in him there is no sin. That's a slap in the face to these false teachers. Because they said, he didn't really have a body, he just kind of looked like he had a body. There's no way that he could have had a body and he was a Messiah because the body is evil. But John says this, and in him there is no sin, none. And so what John is doing here is actually pretty fascinating. He's established against these false teachers that Jesus did in fact have a body and not just the appearance of one. He has just written that he appeared to take away sin and that thus Jesus is the righteous one who, had, uh, who was spirit and had a body and yet in him was no sin. See what he's doing? He has a body and that body was destroyed and yet still he had no sin. And so for a Gnostic, matter is evil, knowledge is good, yet here's Jesus who has both, and he is totally and completely righteous. So John writes this because he knows that such things stand at the very heart of the gospel message, doesn't it? The message they heard from the beginning, the message that was from the beginning, and listen to this again from the very first part of 1 John, which we have heard, which we have seen, in which we have touched. If Jesus doesn't have a body, they can't see, they can't hear, they can't touch, can they? So Jesus Christ, who really appeared, who really had a body, who really had that body nailed to a cross, who really died and was really raised again, this one, John tells us, is the righteous one, and in 3.3 he says, and is pure. In him there is no sin. So he starts there. And as I mentioned a minute ago, John sets up the incompatibility of the one who practices sin and lawlessness with the one in whom there is no sin, in verse 6. He says, no one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. It's pretty scary. That brings up a question, doesn't it? One perhaps that even you have asked yourself, and that is, if I sin, does that mean I'm not abiding in him? Is that what John's teaching here? If I practice righteousness, I'm abiding, but if I sin, I'm not abiding. Is that how it works? First, I want to say that's not how it works. Jesus said he is the door. He did not say he is the revolving door. You are in or you are not. None of this in and out business. 
You're not in Christ and then out of Christ and then in Christ and then out of Christ. If you are in, then you are in. If you are not, then you're not. See, when you're in Christ, that means, that we know from Scripture, that you are in the new covenant. And He is the inaugurator, the initiator, and the keeper of that covenant. And so being in Christ is not like belonging to a country club where you might lose your status or position if you don't pay your dues. Thank God for that, right? So the problem here that John is addressing is not against those who possess faith, but those who merely profess faith. And that's one of the hard things this letter demands that we answer for each one of us. Do we profess faith only or do we actually possess it? That's the distinction. I know what some of you are thinking now, but I still sin, so what does this mean? Well, that's true. We're not yet free from the, the presence of sin yet, are we? So I want you to go back to what John wrote. He has an answer for both the true believer and the merely professing believer. He says this, For the believer, he wrote, No one who abides in him keeps on sinning, or keeps practicing sinning. And for the mere professor, he writes, No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. But the great thing is, John gives an answer for both of them that ends up being the same. In verse 4, He appeared to take away sins, and for the mere professor, he said, He appeared to take away sins. So if you're lacking confidence, John writes to you that Jesus appeared to take away sin. And if you're not in Christ, he writes to you saying, hey, Jesus Christ appeared to take away sin. Same solution for both. So for you, child of God, rest in the fact that Jesus came to take away sin. And for you who are not a child of God, run to him who came to take away sin. And he continues in verse 7. Little children, let no one deceive you. So again, context. These false teachers were leading people astray, lying, saying behavior doesn't matter. And he says behavior does matter. Contact or conduct does matter. He continues, for whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. See that he connects. If it doesn't matter, then it doesn't matter what you do. And John says, no, it does matter because if you practice the wrong thing, you're in trouble. And so the Scottish preacher, Robert Candish, who has a great commentary on this, on this book, says this, There is an inseparable connection between being and doing, between character and conduct, between what a man is and how he acts. The false teachers of John's day held that one might reach in some mysterious way a height of serene, uh, unattainable inward purity and peace, such as, as no things without, not even his own actions, could stain. Which basically means this, one day you'll kind of reach nirvana or whatever they call that, and it doesn't really matter how you lived your life, that's what's going to happen. Because it's through knowledge, not through what you do. And so anyhow, basically John says, for someone who teaches this or says otherwise, they're deceiving you. He says, little children, don't let them. Don't let them pull the wool over your eyes on this. Don't let you think, or don't let them deceive you into thinking the opposite of what I'm telling you, because as he continues in verse 8, he writes this, whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. It seems then that these false teachers in John's day were not only heretical, but also immoral, and they were trying to tear down righteous living. And so you are one or the other. And so now we start to see John in our text begin to tell us the tale of two children here. He's going to make a distinction between both of them, and how you know which one you belong to. So look at the way he contrasts them. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous, but those who practice sinning is of the devil. That's not very popular today, is it? You don't like to hear that kind of stuff. But I want to point out that John doesn't speak about a third group here, does he? He doesn't leave room for a neutral third party. It's either you are of the devil or you are of God, not somewhere in between. And it's been this way from the very beginning. For the devil, he says, has been sinning from the beginning. From the very first, it's been this way. All the way back to the very first couple in the Garden of Eden, when God said to the devil, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So right from the very start, we read about these two children, one of the devil, one of the woman, and they've been fighting ever since. John here uses a present tense. The devil has been sinning from the beginning, meaning he has been sinning from the beginning and he continues to do so even now. 
It's an ongoing thing, you see. It's not he, he started in the beginning and at some point he stopped. Now we're just kind of dealing with the aftermath. No, John says right now he's doing that. So either you're a child of God or a child of the devil, and soon John is going to give us a test, which John, you're all anxiously waiting for, about how you know which one you are. But first he restates what he says. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. Now see, back in verse 5 he said that Jesus appeared to what? To take away sin. So John makes a connection here in verse 8, which is this. The taking away of sin is equated with destroying the works of the devil. The devil has been sinning from the beginning, and Jesus has come to destroy his work. And that's no mere rhetoric. We'll discover in a bit that the practice of sinning, the work of the devil, is quite literally a matter of life and death. It's just not knowledge up there. It's not just something we learn in Sunday school. It has real implications. And so this is why the author of Hebrews wrote this, Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself, which is Jesus, likewise partook of the same things that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is, the devil. So doing the devil's work leads to death and destruction. It's deceitful and it's dangerous. And so Paul writes in Ephesians, which we heard months ago, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. He wouldn't have written that if there was no possibility, would he? So one common fault, and here is where I start to step on the toes, so sorry, but I'm up here and you're down there. So, <laughs> One common fault that exists, especially among Reformed people, which I think most of us in this room are, is that we don't take the supernatural or the, the spiritual side of Scripture seriously enough. Because of errors of other groups, we think we'll back off from that and not talk about it as much. The problem is the Bible doesn't do that. John warns his children, don't be deceived. Remember, doing and being are connected, and if your doing is doing sinning, then you are of the devil. And Ken preached a while ago in 1 Peter, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Jesus had to come to destroy the works of the devil, or else the works of the devil would destroy us. And so before we get to the test... John lays out to determine if you're righteous as Jesus is righteous or if you're of the devil. I want to recap what John is building here. See, the problem with doing the first John the way that we're doing first John is we have a limited amount of time and there's so much text you have to get through it all, right? Let me recap this for a second. He's building the case that in this section regarding the difference of two children, those who practice lawlessness, those who practice righteousness, being and doing are inseparable. He warns his children not to be deceived by those false teachers who would not only deny Christ, but destroy righteous living, which he's encouraging them to do, by abiding in sin. He reminds us that Jesus appeared to take away sin, to destroy the works of the devil. And so the question we asked earlier is, but I still commit sin, so am I a child of God? So look at verse 9. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning. Now, if we stopped just there, we'd be discouraged, wouldn't we? But look where he goes with it. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. And so the key here is he's building this mini chiasm, we call it in literature. Okay? In other words, the very reason one born of God doesn't make a practice of sinning is precisely because that one is born of God. Simple. The new nature won't allow it. And why? Because God's seed abides in him. So we see this many chiasms. So you can write this down if you want to. You don't have to, but it makes more sense if you do. So I encourage you to. If you write on your page the letter A, okay, and then next to that, you write, no one who is born of God. Okay, no one who is born of God. You write that as your first line. And below that line, you indent a little bit to your right there, and you write the letter B, and then you write this, will continue to sin. Okay? So letter A, no one is born of God. Letter B, will continue to sin. And below that, you indent even further past the B, and you write a little letter C there, and you write, because God's seed remains in him. Because God's seed remains in him. Okay, then the next line, I want you to write a letter B underneath the first B, so they're kind of uh, uh, vertical, right? So you measure up. Okay? Which should be aligned again to the B above you, which says, he cannot sin. Okay, so let me recap. A, no one who is born of God. B, will continue to sin. C, because God's seed remains in him. And then B again, he cannot sin. And then finally, 
the last line would be an A again, which is parallel to the first A, okay? Because he has been born of God. Okay? See, there's five lines there. A, B, C, B, A. That's what a chiasm is. Taking the first and the last, which are parallel, taking the second and the third, which are parallel, and they all meet in the middle, which is that C. And that is because God's seed remains in him. So here's how it goes. No one, is, no one who is born of God will continue to sin because God's seed remains in him. He cannot sin because he's been born of God. See how that works? It's pretty cool. Since the fall, sinning is natural to us because we are sinners. But the new birth, he says, is supernatural. The seed here can reference a number of things. It can reference the new birth. It can reference the message. It can reference Jesus. It can reference the Spirit. I personally think it's a combination of all four because that's what God does when He saves a person. What was dead now has life. What was ruined is now being restored. And where sin abounded, Paul tells us later on, that grace abounds all the more. So it's this renewing, this new creation that God gives us in the new birth that doesn't allow the nature to do what it wants to do. So Jesus came to take away sin, but he didn't just leave it at that. So he didn't just come to clean the cup of all the filth and the mold. I'm almost embarrassed to mention this, but here's my story. So in my study, I had a cup of coffee that I'd put on the shelf behind me, and I forgot about it. So I came back like two weeks later. It wasn't pretty. It was no longer liquid, Okay. But he didn't come just to clean that kind of a cup and then just put it away. No, he cleaned the cup and then he filled it with rivers of living water. So it would never go moldy again, you see? That's what he does. The new birth. And that seed, the life that God gives, has the same power that fueled the resurrection of Jesus himself. So that new nature that resides in you, if you're a Christian, won't allow one born of that same power to make a practice of sinning. Remember that word, practice. And this is the basis of why we can be called children of God. Because if you remember what John wrote in his gospel, he says this, But to all who did receive him and who believed in him, he gave the right, the right to become children of God, who are born not of the blood or of the will of man, but of God. It's that seed that abides in the believer, that keeps him from a life of practicing sin. And so the believer has been so transformed that they cannot live in that pattern any longer. It eats at them. They won't do it. What they freely once loved, which is sin, now they freely hate. And what they formerly hated, which is righteousness, now they freely love. And this is the incompatibility I was talking about earlier, that one born of God and the practice of sinning. The one, there is no sin in him, thus if you're in him, practicing sinning has no place. Simple. Simple. So now John gears up to present the evidence by which one knows if you're born of God or if you're of the devil. Look at verse 10. By this it is evident. There's that word. Here's the evidence. Who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil? Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. Did you catch that? John threw a bit of a wrench in here, didn't he? For six verses, he's talked about practicing lawlessness and practicing sinning and doing righteousness and practicing righteousness. But now, he brings forth something else. It's evident who are the children of God compared to the children of the devil. Whoever doesn't practice righteousness is not of God, but he doesn't stop. He says, nor is the one who does not love his brother. So he equates practicing righteousness with loving your brother doesn't he? It's evident then that in addition to these false teachers teaching heresy and deceiving them, in addition to them encouraging people to to not practice a righteous way of living because it didn't matter and leading them astray, it's obvious that they had no love for the brethren or they wouldn't be doing what they did. See, it's all connected. The heresy that deceives destroys righteous living, which leads to no love for the brethren. That's the pattern he builds. You believe the wrong thing, you don't do the right thing, and then you have no love for the brethren. Now that hurts some of us, doesn't it? Just saying, you mean I can't just obey God's commands like a checklist and do righteous things and I'll be okay? And John says, no, not if you don't love your brother, then you're not born of God. So that's how John is defining 
practicing righteousness, loving your brother. And so this is truly where the rubber meets the road, isn't it? This is where we find out if what people say matches what they do. So verse 11 starts with a conjunction. Four. And so the, con- the conjunction connects verses 10 and 11. So it should read this way. By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. So from the very first, the very first gospel message ever given, that was the message delivered. Straightforward and clear. If you go back to chapter 1 in this book, he says this, This is the message we have heard from him and proclaimed to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all, which would include loving your brother. And John isn't telling us anything new that we don't already know either, is he? Back in chapter 2, he said this, Beloved, I'm not writing to you any new commandment. Then he goes on to say that whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. So it's not new. So in other words, John isn't just making this up. It's always been part of the gospel message. And where did he get it? Well, the good mark of a servant, right, or a soldier, is that he doesn't stray too far from his master. So perhaps he's recalling what Jesus told them just as he was about to ascend to heaven. Back in the gospel of John. Jesus says this, as he's about ready to leave them, he says this, Little children, yet, while, yet a little while I am with you, you will seek me, and just as I said to the Jews, so now I also say to you, where I am going you cannot come. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you, you are also to love one another. So John remembers this, and he writes it to his flock. So what a faithful disciple John is. That's how you can tell if someone is following who they should be following, is do they stray far from him or do they stay close to him? And John has stayed close to him. The message that was given to him, the gospel message that they heard from the beginning, love one another, is the same thing he's telling them. So you see, you see the flow this morning. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous because they are born of God and they love one another. It's all connected. And then he says this. He tells us now what we ought to avoid in this matter and what we ought to pursue in this matter. And he gives us a very dramatic example, a tale of two children, two literal children, a pair of brothers, in fact. He says this in verse 12, We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. Now he just said it's evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil, and the one who is not a child of God is the one who does not love his brother, and Cain was of the evil one and he murdered his brother. This is the story back in Genesis 2. I'm sorry, Genesis 4, verse 2. Now Abel was a keeper of sheep and Cain a worker of the ground. And in the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry and his face fell. And the Lord said to him, Why are you angry and why is your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at your door and its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. So Cain spoke to his, to his brother Abel. And when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel your brother? And he said, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? So Jewish literature, I want you to understand where John gets this from. There are a ton of references to Cain. He was held up as the example of evil. The most evil act that anyone could think of. In our day, it would be comparable when you hear someone comparing someone else to Hitler. At least I'm not Hitler. At least they're not Hitler. That's what they used to do with Cain. I may be bad, but at least I'm not Cain. He was held up as this example. See, it was long believed that Cain's act was satanically inspired. And John, I think, here confirms it. Cain, he says, was of the evil one. Cain practiced sin and it started long before he murdered his brother. Cain did not love his brother. In fact, he did the very opposite of love. He murdered him. And so the apostle basically says this, we should love one another, and whatever we do, don't be like Cain, who rather than love his brother, murdered him. That is what practicing lawlessness or abiding in sin looks like. That's the result. And John says, don't do that. 
And why? What caused such evilness in Cain that he went out into a field and he murdered his own brother? Besides the fact that John tells us he's of the evil one. Well, John asked the same question. He answered it. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brothers were righteous. So again, he's setting up that comparison of the righteous and the unrighteous, the tale of two children. What Cain did was evil. What Abel did was righteous. And God warned Cain about where practicing sin led, didn't he? Why are you angry? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you don't do well, I warn you, sin is crouching at your door. And Cain didn't do well. Sin did crouch at his door, and it overtook him, and it caused him to murder. So whatever you think, I know there are different opinions on this, about why Cain's sacrifice wasn't accepted, whether it be because it wasn't of animals, and that was a pattern that God set, or because it wasn't sincere, or because he didn't have faith. The point is, whatever it was that Cain did was not righteous, and he was jealous of Abel because he was righteous, and so he killed him. By faith, Hebrews says, Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice to Cain, through which he was commended as righteous, God commending him by accepting his gifts. Now, based on what we've read so far, it almost sounds like a tangent that John's going on. Practicing righteousness, and all of a sudden he goes into loving your brother, and he brings up this story about Cain and Abel. But John has a very practical reason for doing this. In verse 13, he says, Do not be surprised, brother, that the world hates you. It shouldn't surprise us about how the world treats us if we are righteous. Not as self-righteous, not because you're a pompous jerk about it, but if you're truly righteous. Then verse 14, we know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Don't be surprised, brothers. From the beginning, we have this tale of two children. Abel did what was right, and Cain murdered him for it. And there's also a lesson here, which if you see Cain coming, you should run if you're Abel. <laughs> Sorry. I, uh, I, uh, I couldn't resist that one. Anyway, we have, we have life, we have passed into life, so it should be no wonder that those in death hate us. Here John also draws from his master, if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. So it sees what Christ did and they hated him, so then it sees his children and the world hates them as well. Don't be surprised that the anger towards Cain um, the, the anger that Cain had towards Abel is the same that the world had against me and the same that it has against you. And why? Because God's seed abides in you, thus you, imbi- you abide in life. And so now finally, John gives us the test. How do you know that you are a Christian? How do others know that you are a Christian? Well, Francis Sch- Schaeffer in his book, The Mark of a Christian, says this in his introduction. Through the centuries, men have displayed many different symbols to show that they are Christians. They have worn marks on the lapels of their coats. They've hung chains around their necks. They've had special haircuts. Of course, there is nothing wrong with any of this if one feels it is calling. But there is a much better sign, a mark that has, been, has not been thought up just as a matter of expediency for use on some special occasion or some specific area. It's a universal mark that is to last through all the ages of the church till Jesus comes back. And what is this mark? At the close of his ministry, Jesus looks forward to his death, and he says this to his disciples, A new commandment I give you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this, men shall know that you are my disciples, if you love one another. So how do you know you're a Christian? Do you love the brothers? That's what John says. So you get that? It's not just a mere profession. It's not just knowing all the right theology. A lot of people can recite a lot of right things and they're no better for it. It's not the fish bumper sticker that we have on our car or the bracelets we wear on our wrists or the cross that you hang around your neck. It's not your attendance in church, although I'm glad to see you. Now, the mark of a Christian is, do you love one another? I want to return to that in a moment here. But John goes on, whoever does not love abides in death. See that? You don't love death. Now contrast that with what we were looked at in verse 6. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. Here though John continues the tale of these children, those who abide in death and do not love. In fact, not only do they not love, but now he says in verse 15, 
Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Uh Uh-oh. Maybe John has in mind here the interaction that Jesus has with the Jews in the Gospel of John in chapter 8. Remember this dispute rose up about who their father was. And he says that what he has seen from his father, he does. And what the Jews see from their father, they do. And so they answered him, Abraham is our father. And Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the works that Abraham did. But you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth. You are doing your works, the works that your father did. And they said to him, we have one father, even God. And so Jesus responds to that. He says, if God were your father, you would love me. No, you are of your father, the devil. And your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning. And I think even there, he's thinking back to Cain and Abel. It's evident who are the children of the devil and who are the children of God. The children of the devil did not love. They wanted to kill him. And if God, and this is what he's basically saying, if God were your father, which he's not, you would love me, which you don't. That's the evidence. So, here's where it gets a little sticky. If you're sitting here this morning thinking that you're doing all right because you have no sin or because you sin a little bit and you've never murdered anyone like Cain, I'm not like Cain, and you didn't respond to Jesus like the Jews did, then this is the part where you should probably start to get uncomfortable. And why? Because, he says, everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. Not just taking him out into the field and killing him. If you hate your brother, you are a murderer. This is what Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. You have heard that it was said, you shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you, everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. You say, I've never murdered anyone. Really? Really? Maybe not in the flesh, but what does this look like for us today? You remember Cain. This is why John brought it up. Abel's deeds were righteous, Cain's weren't, and so the murder of Abel did not begin in the field, it began in Cain's heart because he was jealous and he was angry with his brother. And this is why we've talked about the fact that being and doing are inseparable. So maybe you're sitting here this morning and you have an issue with someone else in the church. Again, that's the context, really, of what John's writing about, right? He's talking about brothers in the church. But more than that, it's it's more than just an issue. It's a grudge. It's a state of being. It's a state of practicing sinning. Maybe it's jealousy. Maybe someone has offended you, and you can't handle them anymore. Maybe somebody has done something terrible to you, and you won't forgive and let it go. And so you, you start building these thoughts up in your heart. I can't believe what that person said to me or about me. I can't believe that person gets a position that I want. See, murder isn't just the actual act. It starts in the heart. It starts with being discontent. And that's why God warned, if you don't do well, sin is crouching at the door and it will master over you. It's the thought that your life would be better if this other person wasn't around. I hope I don't have to talk to that guy today. It's... Gets under my skin when I have to interact with that person. I can't believe the, the things that he says and the things that he does. It's doing what you can to destroy them in your heart, to tear them down, to embarrass them. And that's why an anger that is not righteous is such a dangerous thing, especially towards other people, because it breeds hate. And that's why Jesus said what he did, that murderers are liable to judgment, but anyone who is angry with his brother is also liable for the same thing. Because left unchecked, that's where it ends up. See, according to the Bible, saying, I wish they were dead is just as guilty as physically murdering them. And John told us, don't be like that. So that's why returning to the context of 1 John, these false teachers were teaching such a horrible thing. If the body didn't matter, if only knowledge and spirit were good, then why would it matter if you murdered someone? You're just murdering the evil part of them, right? The body, so what what does it matter? But John doesn't let him off the hook. He says, if you hate your brother, you murdered him. And hate isn't a physical thing. It's a product of the heart that manifests itself in behavior such as murder. And so last week, Nick used Hudson. Remember this? His his two-year-old son is an example. And he said, you know, that, that Hudson 
uh, has this, this stuffed animal and he curls his shoulders around and he kind of pets it like this, like Dr. Claw from Inspector Gadget, right? And he kind of, he looks and they don't know why he does that. And I'm not saying, you know, Hudson's evil, but that's just the example that he used, okay? <laughs> but I have a two-year-old as well, Charlotte. And I'm beginning to think that God created two-year-olds to give us spiritual lessons. <laughs> okay? So while Hudson takes this sin metaphorically, okay, and he holds it and he covers it up so no one can see it, my two-year-old is a little bit more blatant about it. So for example, so one day my son, Everett, is sitting in front of the TV on his knees and he's watching a show, and, and Charlie, my two-year-old Charlotte, she loves baby dolls, right? If you know Charlie, she loves baby dolls, and she loves carrying them around, and she also likes using them as a weapon. <laughs> so he's watching from the side. He doesn't see it, so, so Charlie comes by with the baby doll, holding it by the, the, uh, the leg, and she swings it as hard as she can and catches him right in the face with the, with the baby doll head, the hard plastic baby doll head, right? And it hurts, so he starts crying, and so she did it again. That's the nature of, of Cain and Abel. And that was also a teaching moment for my son, saying, son, you gotta, you got to cover up in those situations, right? <laughs> that makes our kids sound so awful, doesn't it? I'll, have to, you know, I'll talk to Nick. Maybe they should just get married. I don't know. But again, I love how John plays on this word abide. You know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. And why? Because murderers, those who don't love, abide in death. The two are incompatible. You can't hate and abide in death and claim to have eternal life. You can't hate your brother sitting in church every week, looking across the aisle going, oh, I wish I could get that guy, and claim that you have eternal life. Everyone who practices sinning is of the devil, and they abide in death, but Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil and give them life. You cannot serve two masters. Either you are of the evil one or you are born of God. And the way you know the difference is, do you love the brothers. Now that's the negative example, and then that's what we're to avoid, but what are we to pursue? We're to pursue love, which is Him. God is love, and how do we know that? Well, I'm glad you asked, because John answers this in verse 16, by this we know love that He laid down His life for us. So He holds up Cain as the example of one who hates, and now He holds up Jesus as the example of one who loves. By this, He says, by this, by this act, we know Love. He laid down his life for us. So I'm not sure if this is what John was actually thinking about or not, but you can almost see the wheels in his head turning as he's writing against these false teachers, and they're saying that Jesus didn't really have the body, and it doesn't really matter what happens to the body because it's just evil anyway. And he's sitting there thinking, don't tell me that it doesn't matter. Don't tell me that how I live doesn't matter. Don't tell me that sin is inconsequential and that what we do is of no importance because I saw love and he was hanging on a cross and that same body was battered and bloodied and died. He laid it down. Why? For us, because he loved us. I don't want to steal the thunder from the guys who are coming after me, preaching, but eventually he goes on to say that in this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us, and he sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. By this we know love, that no one... Not that one takes a life like Cain did, but rather does he lay it down like Jesus did. It's not just saying or knowing, it's doing. We've all heard that, right? Love is an action, not just a feeling. That's why the false teachers were false teachers, deceiving the church into thinking that what one practiced, what one did was inconsequential, and yet the greatest expression of this special knowledge that they claimed to have was found in the one who laid his life down. Now Spurgeon on this verse says this, True love is not satisfied with expressing itself in words. Love must express itself in deeds. Love delights in sacrifices. Love rejoices in self-denials. The more costly the sacrifice, the better is love pleased to make with it. Christ's love is best seen in the laying down of his life. See, hate doesn't cost anything because you take something from someone else. Love costs everything because you're giving something that you own up. So that those who are born again and have his seed abiding them might abide unto him in eternal life. Little children, let no one deceive you. This act of love is a righteous act. That's why he connects them. And John's already stated, he who practices righteousness is righteous as Jesus is righteous. 
Stay with me, I'm almost done. Actually, you know what? I'm on lockup duty, so I can stay as long as I want. <laughs> That's okay. We're good. So removing the true identity of Christ is these false, false teachers and John were trying to do removes God's love. If Christ isn't really who he says he is, and he doesn't really have a body, then God doesn't really have love. Now, at the end of the sermon last week, Nick said this. He left us with a question, which is, what is this hope that we've been given produced in you? If we have received the benefit of God's love, of Jesus laying down his life, if we know love by the very real evidence Jesus left, then John says, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. So I urge you this morning, if you have a grudge against someone else, especially in here, then love them. Lay your life down. Now, most of us will not be called physically, probably in this life, to have to lay our life down for another here. But laying the life down ought to be our attitude. It ought to be our being. It ought to be our practice in righteousness. So has someone offended you? Lay your life down. Put their needs before yours. And finally, John leaves us this morning with a practical question. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? So he goes very practical very quickly. I understand that most of you will not have to give your life in a physical way, but there's other ways you can do it. Notice what he didn't say here. He didn't say, but if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his hand against him, he said closes his what? Heart against him. Meaning if you've been blessed, then it is your obligation, your privilege to bless others. We are called to love one another. And one way we demonstrate that is not closing our heart to those in need. Evidently, these false teachers were not loving the brothers by caring for their needs. The body doesn't matter, so who cares if you eat? The question is, do you? We have been blessed with so many things where we live. We ought to do what we can. We have a benevolence fund. If you don't know where to start, talk from the elders about that. People in this church need meals. God was not stingy with us, so why are we stingy with other people in our possessions and in our attitude? Or to meet the needs of the brothers. And why? Because we too once had a need, a need that was so deep and so hurtful and so wide and so extraordinary that it can only be filled by one person doing one thing. And that was Jesus by dying on the cross. Our need was life and he gave his life so we could have it. How then can we close our hearts towards our brothers? If you do that, as John says, how does God's love abide with you? So here at the end, we find a direct correlation between what we are and what we do, what we profess and what we perform. And despite the false teachers of John's day, despite the false teachers even in our own day, conduct and behavior does matter. How we treat people does matter. We can't claim to believe in Jesus and then grumble, complain, and tear other people down at the other side of our mouth. How we treat people matters. Because by it, he says, we know that we belong as children of God. And Jesus said, you will know them by your fruit, or by their fruit. Will children believe the right things? Let your life be characterized by righteousness, by righteous living. Love the brothers, not by hating them, not closing your heart towards them, but because Jesus emptied his heart for us. And so next week I pass this on to my brother Joel as he comes up next week, and I'll end with the verse that he gets to start with. Little children, let us not love in word or in talk, but in deed and in truth. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word this morning, and it would be my prayer that even in my own heart and those, of, those uh, who are listening this morning or even online or wherever they are at, they would take this to heart, that they would love the brethren here as a mark of one who is claiming to be of you. Don't let us act that way. You have sanctified us, meaning you have set us apart for a holy purpose. Let us now act like it. Thank you for Christ and his willingness to lay down his life, showing us love that we might have eternal life.
Let that extend beyond our own stinginess of our hearts to the brothers in need, whether by thought or deed or action or word or heart or whatever it is. I pray this thing in the name of your Son, the faithful and Savior Jesus Christ. The preceding message was presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado, and we hope you've been challenged and encouraged to grow in your relationship with Christ. Each week our sermons are made available online and may be downloaded and distributed. If you have questions or comments or would like to speak to one of our pastors, please contact us through our website at southsidebible.org.